Hey guys, welcome to week 16. This week we're studying East Asia and the Islamic empires. We have a lot of really interesting stuff this week. It is the end of period four. After this, we're in period five, and that will be the starting of second semester, which is pretty exciting. Anyway, here we go. So the Ming Dynasty is who we're going to pick up with first. The Ming Dynasty is going to pick up where the Wan, or the Mongols, left China, and they're going to come into power next. Now, Emperor Hong Wu is going to be the first person to uh, start the Ming Dynasty, and he's going to be followed by Emperor Yongle. Um, Emperor Yongle is going to send a lot of um, uh, sailors throughout the world trying to establish China as, a, as the foremost leader of maritime trade. We're also going to have trying to restructure the government system, which the Ming Empire does very, very efficiently. So, you know from your map, the Ming Empire is quite large. Now, the Great uh, Wall is going to be completed by the Ming Dynasty. Now, the origins uh, occurred long before in the Qin Dynasty. The original wall was built, but under the Ming Dynasty, they are going to increase it. They're going to make it higher. They are going to also... Uh, make it so it's much more of a structure as well as a barrack. So Ming Dynasty is the one who finishes the Great Wall to the extent of which we think of the Great Wall. Now, while the Ming are going to be in power, they're going to try to eradicate what happened with the Mongols. Now, the Ming emperors encourage abandonment of Mongol names, dress, any type of Mongolian influence. They do support the study of the Confucian classics and trying to bring it back to the Chinese culture again. Civil service examinations are renewed. We're going to see that it's going to become um, a norm and going right back into the traditional being. Now, eventually, the Ming Dynasty, as all dynasties, are going to decline as well. By the 16th century, maritime pirates are going to cause the largest damage on the Ming Empire. They're going to start really attacking the trade routes, which is really going to lead to a lot of problems and demise. Navy and the government has eventually become unable to respond effectively, and emperors secluded in Forbidden City Palace in Beijing are going to... Um, essentially isolate themselves from the people and it's just going to lead to a collapse. Now the collapse is going to occur because of famine, uh, peasant rebe rebellions, and rebels are eventually going to take Beijing. Uh, we're going to have Manchus refuse to allow establishment of Ming Dynasty, and then we're going to see the increase of the Qing, or the Pure Dynasty, is going to replace them. Now the Qing Dynasty is going to be um, based of the Machuis. Now, these people are originally pastoral nomads, which means that they are not of Chinese descent originally. However, they are farmers and they are of, of uh, good folk who are going to then lead and unify China in probably one of the most successful dynasties of Chinese history. Now, they are going to establish control over Korea, Mongolia, and China. They're going to have a war with the Ming loyalists, and they're going to get support from the Chinese who are fed up with the Ming corruption. So the Manchuists are going to forbid intermarriage. Um, we're also going to see that we're going to force Manchu hairstyles as a sign of loyalty in order to ensure that people are uh, really being uh, are following the new laws. Now, Emperor Kangxi is a Confucian scholar and poet, has military conquests in Taiwan, Tibet, and Central Asia, and his grandson, Kwai Long, is going to be expanding territory in the height of the Qing Dynasty and has great prosperity, tax collection, uh, does get canceled on several occasions because the government's so, doing so well. Now, one of the biggest things that happened during the Qing Dynasty is that they are going to be affirmed as the son of heaven as emperors. That means they are considered almost godlike. They're not gods, but they are one step away. Clothing designs and named characters forbidden to the rest of the population. They are a unique thing. Kowtow is invented during this time. Three bows, nine head knocks in order to show respect to this uh, quasi-divine person. Now, we're going to see a lot of scholarship and bureaucrats come into power as well. They're going to run the government on a day-to-day -day basis while the emperor is just supervising. Um, 
Anyone who becomes a scholar or bureaucrat is going to graduate from intense civil service examinations. However, they're only open to men. The curriculum is Confucian-based, calligraphy, poetry, and essay writing, also history and literature. But the thing is, anyone who does it, you know, are allowed to be a part of it. Now, the civil service examinations are brought back in. Uh, district, provincial, and metropolitan levels are allowed to test. Only 300 allowed to pass at highest level. So we're going to see that multiple attempts are common for people to try to get to this passing score. Now, students are expected to bring bedding chamber pots for three-day uninterrupted examinations. So you're literally sitting in there for three days, and there is no break. You are testing the entire time. If you think taking the SATs are bad, you have no idea. Anyway, students search for printed materials before entering private cells. So... Now, the examination system in society, there's going to be ferocious competition. Lots of things are going to be changing. People are going to be um, so competitive with one another. It's about being the best, not about being the nicest, most respectful, or anything like that. Now, the Queen Dynasty, over 1 million degree holders compete for about 20,000 government positions. The remainder turn to teaching and tutoring positions. We're going to have some corruption and cheating. However, the advantage for wealthy classes, hiring private tutors. So education is going to become much more common. Now, it's going to be open to all, but and it's a tremendous opportunity for social nobility. We're going to see that it is an opportunity for people to rise. Obviously, it's not that common, but it is an opportunity. Now, the patriarchal family... Uh, Fivefold piety is understood as a duty of a child to parent and individual to emperor. We're going to see that this is going to be reinforced and is the best thing possible. Now, the eldest son is favored, of course, and its clan-based authority groups augmented services. So, gender relations. Males receive preferential status, of course. Economic factors. Joins girl, uh, join, girls join husband's family. Infanticide inf is common, which means they're going to kill off women until they get a male first child. Uh, men control divorce. Grounds from infidelity to talking too much are a reason why a woman can be divorced. Now, foot binding is going to become very, very popular. We see traces of it in the third period, but during the fourth period, especially during the Queen, um, it's going to be come back. Now, it starts in the Song Dynasty. Linen strips are binded and deformed female children's feet. It's perceived as aesthetic value. Um, we're going to see that Commoners might bind feet of especially pretty girls to enhance marriage. It's supposed to show that you don't need to work. That you're a part of this because you can be and you have the wealth not to. Now, the population growth and economic development, only about 11% of China is arable, which means um, it can really be farmed on a large scale. Intense gardening style and agriculture is necessary. American food crops are introduced in the 17th century. May, sweet potato, and peanuts are a huge thing. Uh, the rebellions of war reduced the population in the 17th century, which are going to be offset by the increase due to the American crops. So we're going to see a lot of wars and a lot of rebellions, which are going to kill off a lot of people. However, we're going to see population grow because of American goods, and just like we saw in Africa. Now... Foreign trade, silk and porcelain, tea and lacquerware, which is really shiny, really pretty painted wood, is going to be the most common uh, exports Chinese in return. Import relatively little. Spices, animal skin, wool and textiles are going to be the only thing they really import. Exporting is such a big thing um, for them. Their whole economy is really based on it. Now, pay for exports with silver bullion from the Americas. That's how they pay for everything, and that's why the Spanish spend so much time in Spain and uh, Asia because the Japanese really prefer the silver. Now, after Yongle's early maritime expeditions, the Ying Dynasty abandons large-scale maritime trade plans. They realize that they really don't want to have that much of a varying change in part to appease the southern population. So they're going to no longer focus on ocean trade. They're going to focus on internal trade and building up their trade. Um, they're also going to be focusing on Southeast Asia. Now, Chinese merchants continue to be active in Southeast Asia, especially in Manila. 
and they're going to continue to have executive dealings with the Dutch. The Dutch are the only ones who are going to be allowed into Asia on a regular basis. Now, government and technology during the Tang and the Song dynasties, China is a world leader in technology. It's going to stagnate during the Ming and the Qing dynasties um, because European cannons, cannons are purchased and they're going to be based on the early Chinese invention of gunpowder. So governments are going to suppress technological advancement, fearing social instability would result. So what we're going to have is they're going to limit the amount of technology in order to keep um, their civilians in check. Now, changes in Chinese society are going to be based on privileged classes. We're going to have a scholar level. We're also going to have a distinctive clothing that is going to be based on ranks. And there's going to be immunity from some legal proceeding, taxes, and labor serv uh, services based on who you are and where you fit. Now, the working class is made up of peasants, artisans, workers, and merchants. Um, Confucian doctrine gives greater status to peasants because they're the ones who are essentially feeding the entire population and they should be seen with respect. The merchant activity, not actively supported, but obviously condoned because it brings wealth into China. Now the lower classes, the military, the beggars, and the slave are obviously very low and not uh, really given that much respect. Now Neo-Confucianism is going to become very, very popular during the Qing Dynasty. It's going to be a version of Confucian promoted by the Zhao Zi. And they believe it's a bl it is a blending of Confucian morality with Buddhist logic. So it's a blending of the two. Education at various levels promoted it. Um, many provincial schools are going to do it. And it, it's a compilation of massive yogul encyclopedia, which is all the different cultural references, all the different components. Um, it's going to be the development of popular novels as well. So it's going to have a no uh, very deep influence. Now, Christianity in China... The Nestorian and the Roman Catholic Christians had a presence in China. They are going to disappear with plague and social chaos in the 14th century. However, during the fourth period, the Jesuits are going to return with a guy named Matteo Rossi. And he's going to try to convert the Ming Emperor Wallini. Uh, before he even steps in China, he masters Chinese before his first visit in 1601. And he brings... Western mechanical technology like prisms, harpsichord, and clocks. And this is used to introduce Western ideas and thoughts and try to get the emperor to be interested in these types of things so he can teach them about Christianity. Now, Matteo is going to argue that Christianity was consistent with Confucianism. It's going to differ due to the Neo-Confucian distortions. However, Christianity is supported by the traditional thoughts of the Japanese culture. Now, although Mateo is very successful and has an, a profound impact on China during this time period, very few people actually convert to Christianity. Only about 8% of the population are actually Christian. And eventually Christian absolutism is going to be uh, for Chinese, to, it's very difficult for Chinese to affect. Um, we're going to see that uh, the Franciscan and the Dominican are going to try to convince people that the Pope is trying to m manipulate them and control them. So this Catholic versus Protestant are going to cause a lot of problems and stir a lot of controversy up in China. Now, eventually, um, he, eventually China is going to ban Christianity entirely from China. Now, let's talk about Japan. Now, Japan is going through a major uh, political as well, which will eventually have a social impact. Now, the shoguns who currently are ruling Japan from the 12th to the 16th century are large landholders. They have an emperor merely as a figurehead. Essentially, they're the ones controlling everything, but the emperor is just there. Um, there's constant civil wars and a lot of different conflicts and a lot of uh, very challenging civil wars. However, the Tokawa are going to establish a military government. They're going to be based on the Bakufu, which is a tent government. It's going to establish a Tokawana dynasty. Now, the Tokawana dynasty are going to create a dynamo. Now, there's approximately 260 powerful territory lords 
who have independent militaries, judiciary, schools, foreign relations, and all that. What's going to happen is that we're going to now try to bring them together. From the Capitol, we're going to see the Shogun requires alternate attendance. The Daima are forced to spend every year in that court. Now, this court is going to try to regulate and blend kind of the cultures together to make it more of a cohesive group. So they're going to control marriages and the socializing of these families in order to ensure that one unified group is what's going to be the outcome. Now, beginning in the 1360s, the shoguns are going to ha restrict foreign relations. They're going to stop allowing Europeans to influence Japanese culture, and they're going to have more of an isolationist background. They're going to enforce this theory, uh, this policy for about 200 years. Now, once the end of social conflict uh, occurs once everything, all the civil wars die down, we're going to see huge prosperity. There's going to be new crops, there's going to be better irrigation systems, and we're going to see the population growth is moderate. We're going to have contraception, late marriages, and abortions, which are going to become more commonplace in Japan during this time. And we're also going to see a lot of infant side or the thinning of the rice shoots, which means we're trying to limit the lower level people more than our upper level people. Now social change is going to be the end of civil dis uh, disturbances which will create massive unemployment. Samurai warriors are going to be out of a job. Because they are a part of the old system, they're essentially shunned and rejected from the new system and they are currently unemployed. Now, to encourage to join bureaucracy, scholarship is going to become a major focal point for this new Japanese regime. Now, although some people are unwilling to join, we're going to see a huge decline into poverty of people who are not complying. And the urban wealthy classes develop from trade activities. So we're having the wealthy who are following this new system become incredibly successful and very, very powerful, while the people who are rejecting this new system are becoming poorer and poorer and poorer. Now, Neo-Confucianism is also going to have a big influence in Japan. Chinese cultural influence is going to extend into Japan during this time period. Um, we're going to see that Chinese language is going to be an essential part of Japanese culture and Japanese schoolings. Um, Zui and the Neo-Confucian remains very popular. Although they have a native learning, which is talking about Shintoism and folk traditions of Japan, we're going to see that the Japanese are going to adopt a lot of that uh, Chinese scholarship of this time. Now, the urban culture of Japan is going to be in is going to be expressed in entertainment and pleasure industries because Japan Japan is now flourishing during this time because less civil wars, less conflict, a lot more, uh, a lot less civil unrest. We have a lot more money. With a lot more money, we have a lot more avenues to spend money. And we're going to have the Kabuku Theater is going to be a very common entertainment source. Men playing women roles, of course. Women cannot be on stage. That's crazy. And the Bakuru, which is a puppet theater, becomes very, very common. Now, Christianity in Japan. We're going to see that Christianity is going to take off in, in Japan with the Daimo. Daimo are hoping to establish trade relationships with the Europeans. So they are going to take it in, uh, on in order to show um, kindness and extend an olive branch to them. There is going to be government backlash, though, because they're fearing that of government intrusion and their fear of a coup by European nations trying to take over Japan. Confucians, Buddhists uh, resent the Christian absolutism and this is how it is. And we're going to see that an anti-Christian campaign is going to execute staunch Christians and eventually lead to the restriction of Christianity. Um, sometimes they are even going to crucify the Christians as well. And this is being done in like the 1600s, which is pretty cool. Now, the Dutch learning, keep in mind, the Japanese are the only ones who are trading with the Chinese. The Dutch are also having a huge influence with the Japanese as well. Um, the Japanese and the Chinese rely on the Dutch for most of their trade because they have such a fear of other Europeans. So a lot of the understanding of the world of especially the European world beyond their borders is going to come from the Dutch perspective. So we're going to see that 
Japanese scholars study the Dutch approach to European science, medicine, and art, which is going to actually limit them in later on. Now, we are done with East Asia. Let's jump into the Islamic empires. Now, when we're in the Islamic empires, we're talking about the Ottoman, the Safed, and the Mughal empire. Now, the Ottoman empire is first. Osman leads bands of semi-nomadic Turks into and captures um, Anatola with a light cavalry and volunteer infantry. Okay, we're going to see that they call themselves Ganzis or Muslim religious warriors. So they are conquering in the name of Allah. Now in the Balkans, they force Christian families to surrender young boys to military service, and this is called Defer Sharmi, which often grow up to be exceptionally loyal Janissaries, which we're going to see this is going to come in and uh, play later on. Now the Ottoman Empire is going to... Um, have the first great leader is Mahed II. He's going to capture Constantinople in 1453. He's going to rename it Istanbul. Now, with the transformation from warrior sultan to emperor of two lands, he really plans to capture as much con uh, territory as possible, and he tries to co uh, capture the pope, which is unsuccessful, but definitely scares the Christians significantly, and we're going to see a lot more defenses are going to be built in Italy based on Mahed and Constantinople falling to the Islamic Empire. Now, the most famous of the Ottoman emperors is going to be Suleiman the Magnificent. He is expanded into Asia and Europe. He is going to try to take Vienna in 1529. It's not going to go well, but it's uh, pretty deep into the heart of Europe, which is impressive. And he's going to develop them as a naval power. Now, the next major empire is going to be the Safed Empire. Now, we're going to see that Ismail is going to be grow up and he will become the uh, leader of the Safed Empire. He becomes Shah. He believes the twelfth, and he proclaims the official religion of the realm, the twelve verse Shiism, which is named after Muhammad. It's about the twelfth Imam is in hiding and ready for power, and believes that anywhere that the next leader of Islam is out there, and they just have to pull him out. Now, Battle of Chaladin is going to be where the Ottoman attack the Safids, and we're going to see they use. The Ottoman gunpowder technology give them the upper hand. So Ismail is going to escape, and two centuries of ongoing conflict between the Ottomans and the Safids. Now Shah Abbas the Great is going to revitalize the Safed Empire and reform administration, military expand trade, and military expansion. So we're going to see that the battle of Chaldron and the Ottoman Empire is going to weaken the Safid, but with Shah Abbas, it's going to come back into power and hang around for quite some time. Now the Mughal Empire is probably the most famous of these Islamic empires. Um, Zahar al-Din Muhammad, or Babur the Tiger, is invades northern India for plunder, or just for goods, for resources in 1523. However, once he gets there, he falls in love with the people, um, the culture, and sticks around. Now, because of the gunpowder that they're using, it gives them a huge advantage over the native population that doesn't have it. And he's going to found the Mughal, or Persian, for Mongol dynasty. It's eventually going to expand through most of the Indian subcontinent. Now, Akbar is going to be the grandson of Babur, and he wins, he wins fear and respect for throwing Adham Khan, leader of the army, out the window twice. The second time was just to make sure he was dead. He threw the leader of the military, who he thought was a spy, and who was trying to have a coup of his government, throws him out the window. Now, Akbar is going to create a centralized government, which is going to be the first time since period three. He's going to destroy the Hindu kingdom of Vaigarnar, and he is going to be religiously tolerant, and he's going to promote the divine faith, which is a blend of Islam and Hinduism. So, a very strong leader. Now we're going to have Arguzilib. I know these names are awful. I'm so sorry. Now, he, they are going to expand the Mughal Empire into southern India. They are going to be incredibly hostile towards Hinduism. They're going to demolish Hindu temples, replace with mosques. They're going to tax them. And obviously this isn't going to go well because of 
their destruction of all of these Islamic temple, I mean, all these Hindu temples, we're going to see that there's a lot of anger, aggression towards them, and it's going to lead to a lot of civil fighting. Now, common elements of the Ottoman, the Safed, and the Mughal, Mughal empires, they're based on military conquest. They're known as the gunpowder em empires. They are the first people to use gunpowder as a weapon on a massive scale to conquer, over, conquer new territory. Um, they're going to have a prestige of a dynasty development on piety and military prowess. So it's all about respectful of the emperor. It's all about organizing a centralized government where the emperor is in direct and complete control. However, it's still about military and getting things more effective. They're going to have close relations, uh, relationism with Sufism and Gandhi tradition of requiring non-Muslim to fight in the military as well. Now, the steep Turkish traditions of unilateral decrees, intra-family conflicts over power, we're going to see that are going to continue to occur. Now, women are going to play a role um, to a degree. Women are officially banned from polit political activity. Uh, however, revering mothers, first wives, uh, we're going to see are still being important. Suleiman the Magnificent is going, differs to concubine, which means we're going to have a lot of Ukrainian women are going to be brought in as the best type of concubine. And they're going to convince husband to murder eldest son in favor of her own child. And concubines are very, very popular. She just happens to be the most famous. Now, agriculture and trade that's going to be improved at this point are American traps are going to have a less dramatic effect in the Muslim empires. Coffee, tobacco are important. However, um, we're going to have a fear of lax morality for coffee houses. They were the places where evil people would get together and discuss and plan and plot. So next time you go to Starbucks, think about that. <laughs> now the population growth is also going to reflect territorial additions and losses. We're going to see that the shape of these empires are going to increase and shrink on the regular basis. Remember, they are a military-based empire. So they're going to be constantly looking to expand. When you're constantly looking to expand, you can also lose. Trade with the English, the East India Trade Company specifically, and the French East India Trade Company, and the Dutch VOC are going to take off during this part. Now, the Mughal Empire is going to have the largest population growth, while the Safed is going to be the least, and the Ottoman are going to do okay. Now, the religious diversity in these empires are going to be pretty limited. In the Ottoman Empire, you do have some Christians and some Jews. The Safed Empire are going to have some Zoroastrians, some Jews, and some Christians. But in the Mughal, you're going to have the most diversity with Hindu, Jains, Zoroastrians, Christians, and Sikhs. So the blending of the Mughal Empire is going to be where it's more culturally rich. Now, the Mughal Akbar is the most tolerant because there were so many different types of religion already in India. We're going to see he's going to receive the Jesu uh, receive the Jesuits who are going to come in and try to convert people to Catholicism, but resented Christian exclusivity. He believed Christianity was awful, and eventually um, resent kicks them out of India. Now the status among religious minorities, non people, non Muslim were protected people. Um, they had a special ta special tax they had to pay. They did have a freedom to worship and property and legal affairs. However, in the Ottoman communities, the millet system of self-administration, they were limited to a degree. You weren't rejected because you weren't a Muslim. However, your life is easier because you won't be a Muslim. Uh, now, the Mughal M rule, the Muslims are supreme, but work in tandem with Hindus, so they're going to work together. Now, capital cities are going to grow. Istanbul is going to be the cultural capital of the Ottoman Empire and have massive monumental architecture. The rededication of the Hagia Sophia turns to Hagia Sophia Mosque, which is one of the largest mosques in the world at this time. And we're going to see the Akbar builds, magnificent. Sikri, which is a site without a sufficient water supply. It has to be abandoned. Also, the Mughal Empire is going to build the Taj Mahal, which is probably one of the largest and most famous buildings in the world. Now, the deterioration of imperial leadership is going to be seen because the Ottoman princes are going to be lazy through luxury. We're going to see the attempts to isolate them compounds the problem. So we're going to see the isolation of the leadership away from the people is going to cause more problems. 
we're going to see that movements of people are going to be denouncing the Ottomans and the Safed Shiites are going to be persecuting the Sunnis and the non-Muslims. Economic and military decline of the empire's foreign trade is going to be controlled by the Europeans. Military administrative is network is expensive to maintain, which means we're going to have a lot of money being spilt, spent on military when not having a lot to show for it. Unproductive wars and European military technology, technology is advancing faster than the Ottomans can purchase it. They're not creating their own technology. They're stealing it from the Europeans. It's a slower process than if they decide to do it on their own. Finally, cultural conservatism. Europeans are actively studying Islamic cultures for the purpose of trade and missionary activities, so Islamic culture is less interested in, in the outside world. They become a lot more isolated and focus solely on themselves. Um, they swiftly fall behind in technological development. Um, however, we're going to see this is going to become a lasting problem, especially in period five, when Europe is going to go through massive trends. Anyway, guys, that's the end of week 16. I hope you have a great week, and I'll see you in class.